Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Supernova Hackathon workshop, the first one being hosted after the main event on May 10th. My name is Andrew, and I work at Definity in the growth team. Before we, before we go on, just want to mention that this session is being recorded, and it's going to, it's going to be available on Definity's YouTube channel. So today, we have Bob Bodley from Tonic Labs. If you've been here long enough around the inner computer ecosystem, you know Bob as one of the leading forces behind NFTs on the inner computer. He even used to have the title Chief NFT Officer, which he now changed to a more boring Chief Product Officer at Tonic Labs. Bob is going to talk about uh, the power of NFTs and why and how you as developers can use them. There is a live Q&A session, so if you have any questions, just feel free to type it in there. Without further ado, Bob, take it away. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so my name is Bob Bodily, uh, Chief Product Officer at Tonic Labs, although inside I will always be the Chief NFT Officer at uh, Tonic Labs uh, today and forever. So uh, yeah, love everything about NFTs. Uh, definitely a lot of hype around NFTs. Uh, maybe too much hype, uh, maybe not, uh, maybe it's justified. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about some of the, you know, key affordances of an NFT and then how we can take advantage of those to build really interesting decentralized applications on the internet computer. Uh, before we start, I really like to take Q&A as I go throughout the presentation. Uh, you know, I feel like if I start now and just kind of ramble off in a direction for 40 minutes, you know, we might not end up where you all want to end up. And I want it to be a little bit more interactive. And uh, so feel free to, there's a Q&A section. I think you can post questions uh, in the Zoom. Uh, so if everyone can find that Q&A section, just throw something in the Q&A. Uh, maybe it's a question about NFTs. Maybe you're wondering, you know, how to get started from a technical perspective. Maybe you're wondering, like, why? Why do we care about NFTs? Maybe you want to know why uh, people scream about airdrops and why people want you to uh, create NFTs for them. Or, uh, but yeah, please drop questions in the Q and A. Uh, also, uh, in, uh, I, I have a. Over here, you know, Q&A pulled up, chat pulled up, participants pulled up. So feel free to, uh, you know, use the tools to to get get your thoughts out and I'll take questions along the way. Um, awesome. So, but then we wouldn't pick for you. You can just pick for yourself the, the questions. So you want us to read through while you're giving the, the talk? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to do whatever. You know, if, if, if you want to read through and, you know, every, after, you know, a set amount of time, you can chime in with a question. That's fine. All right, cool. Uh, to start off, I wanted to talk about the benefits of the internet computer as a blockchain and why it's really good for NFTs. Uh, so three main reasons, I think, why NFTs are... They're, they're kind of meant for the internet computer. Uh, the first one is you can host all of your assets on chain. Uh, hosting assets on chain isn't really possible on other blockchains. For example, on Ethereum, it's probably hundreds of millions of dollars to store a gigabyte of data on chain. And that's just not feasible for anyone to, to store data. So you can't store data on chain, which means people resort to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems like IPFS or like Arweave. And those kinds of solutions work, although now you have, you know, your contract living on Ethereum and you have your data living on IPFS and your metadata living on IPFS. It's just kind of a disjointed experience where on the internet computer, you can just have everything integrated on chain on canisters. So it's really, really nice. Uh, then there are no gas fees to mint NFTs. I mean, technically there is a cost to mint NFTs, but it's in cycles and it's very, very, very small. Like, you can mint 10,000 NFTs and transact thousands of transactions on a marketplace and pay $5 in gas fees or cycles, uh, which is you know much better than say Ethereum. Uh, this reverse gas model also has benefits for usability. Uh, usability benefits because you don't need token to interact with the chain. On Ethereum, you have to buy ETH in a centralized exchange, then you have to transfer it to a MetaMask, and then you have to uh, actually use that token to sign transactions when something's hosted on, on Ethereum. On the internet computer with the reverse gas model, you can log in with something called internet identity, 
and you don't even need a wallet and you're already in, in an application and you can issue that user NFTs to their principal. And so they, they, they didn't even need to have a wallet. They didn't need to, uh, you know, buy token anywhere. It's just a really, really clean user experience. And so that's another big benefit is the reverse gas model on the internet computer. And generally it's just cheaper to, to interact. And part of that is due to the subnet structure of the internet computer. Internet computer, uh, you could think of it like shards, shards its network into these little subnets where you have something like 13 nodes. And the uh, you, you only do consensus within a subnet. So you do lose some things, uh, but I think the trade-offs are really good. Uh, the f uh, let's see, I think we already talked about storage costs. So those uh, those benefits, you know, pack them all together, and now you can do really crazy stuff with NFTs. Uh, in fact, I have a really fun thread on Twitter uh, where it's just a whole bunch of crazy ideas of things you can do with NFTs uh, that are specifically enabled. Before we get into the that, uh, there's a question about storage costs. So uh, Rudy said that the IPFS storage is still cheaper than IC, though. Is there any way to integrate uh, IPFS with IC? Yeah, that's an excellent comment. So storage on the IC is, is it's, it's not expensive, but if you compare it to other, uh, other storage solutions like AWS or IPFS, I think you could find cheaper alternatives. Uh, you may not get the same guarantees in terms of security or stability or anything like that. But um, yes, I, I know that Fleek, if you look at Fleek, it's one of the psychedelic products. They have a hosting solution using IPFS. So it's all set up. You can actually host static websites. You just connect it to GitHub. It's actually a pretty slick tool and you can pick, I want to host on IPFS or I want to host on internet computer. And then it'll just kind of enable you to host. And so I know there are people doing a lot of stuff on IPFS, if, especially if you're hosting extremely large assets you know, like huge 3D models or huge metaverse files or, you know, big video files, it might make sense to do to do something like that. Um, yeah. I still like to host the large files on the IC anyways. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely possible to host large files on the IC anyway. Yeah. Uh, now, that I stopped, now that I stopped you, we have one more question about, okay. are you going to talk about uh, NFT standards later? Uh, yeah, we can talk about oh. NFT standards. Um, let's talk about a bunch of crazy ideas, and then we can talk about standards. I'll circle back. Cool. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the crazy ideas uh, that we could do on the internet computer compared to what's currently being done on, on like Ethereum or Solana. So most, if, it, if, if you think about a typical NFT, it's just like a, a PFP or a profile picture. It's a static image. Images hosted on IPFS, you know, you have a contract hosted on Ethereum and that has a pointer to the image and it's just static and just sits there and maybe you can use it, you know, by signing in MetaMask as an access token into a metaverse experience or a chat or, you know, an exclusive Discord channel or something like that. Uh, and that's pretty much how people are doing NFTs. I mean, there are some, some people doing more interactive type experiences, but not a lot. And so the majority of the ideas I want to talk about are how do we go from like a static, you know, static NFT profile picture to a more interactive NFT experience. And so uh, let's look at one example, like uh, one, one idea that I've been really liking recently is a NFT based loyalty and rewards program. So, you know, imagine, you know, the gym you go to, or imagine the Etsy shop that you want to buy a painting from, or, you know, a Shopify site that you want to buy a custom t shirt. And all of these pro, all, all of these businesses, uh, either they have a like a, a loyalty or rewards program, or they would benefit from a, a rewards program. And generally, it's through I don't know, like you know, collect points, and we'll store points in our own database. And then with those points, you can do things like you can get a discount, or you can get like a premium membership to get discounts over time, or something. But from like a a blockchain perspective, imagine you can give NFTs. And imagine you can like level up your NFT over time if you do the things that 
uh, this particular business cares about. So maybe if you share on social media, like you could have a simple script, you know, that's checking specific hashtags on social media and rewarding a specific account with uh, specific, but you're, you're, you're basically feeding data into this, this NFT that you can then level up. And then based on the status of your NFT at any given time, you get a specific reward. So maybe it's, you know, 10% off or 20% off or buy one, get one free, or you could unlock different uh, statuses as you go up. And that specific NFT could be transferable if you were okay with that. So now you level up, you have a super awesome NFT. By default, you have a secondary marketplace. Maybe it's even just drop in on their website. And now you can just go buy discounts if you wanted, or you could sell, you know, sell the souped up royalty rewards program NFT that you have. Uh, so that's one idea that I think would be really cool. Maybe even just build it in with like a Shopify integration. I mean, uh, that's kind of like a web 2.5 kind of idea, I might say. 2.5 because you're building from web 2 tech <clears throat> and you're integrating web 3 tech into it uh, to, to solve problems in a better way. So that's one idea that I think would, would be really cool. And then there are some kind of more gimmicky ideas, but still things that people aren't really doing like uh the the tamagotchi nft like i really just want a pixelated creature that i can feed every day you know that that talks to me and tells me that i'm awesome and that i'm a good owner and and really the the tamagotchi could be its own nft and the entire game could live in the nft meaning you could play it in your wallet so you just go to your wallet you know pull up plug or pull up stoic and it's just going to like be there in your wallet. And then you have different ways to interact, you know, with your little pet. Uh, and based on those interactions, you know, you can store all of the data for that specific NFT in a canister. It's all on chain and, you know, it can grow over time. You know, you can make it, make it evolve. You could give it food. You could, you know, so all the. Technically the, the mini game would be inside of the, like an iframe in the NFT. Well, so the the NFT view, I mean, it's it's essentially an HTML page where the the entire game just lives as the NFT. So, like a thumbnail view, you you, you couldn't play it in the thumbnail view, but if you go to the full on chain view, then you right. could play it wherever you want. And there, you you don't have to like save your game or anything because you're actually interacting with the NFT data stored in the canister for that NFT, and so you just uh. Yeah, although you would need wallet authentication to prove you're the owner so that nobody else could play your Tamagotchi. Or internet identity, right? Right, right. Yeah, you you need some kind of authentication mechanism. But, I mean, that's a really cool idea. Everyone loves, oh, maybe not everyone, maybe, you know, I'm old school, but uh, I think people would really like that kind of idea. And we haven't had something like that yet. Uh, you know, Tamagotchi style. I just want a cute pet that I can feed and it can tell me I'm awesome. So yeah, definitely a cool idea. Uh, and from there, I mean, you you kind of get the flavor of the interactive NFT. Like imagine there's there's a project right now called I, I See Dinos and you started with an egg and then you were able to hatch your egg into a baby dino. And pretty soon you're going to be able to kind of level up your NFT into like a teenager dino. And uh, some, so you, you can do these kinds of progressions with NFTs, that's that's really cool. Uh, similar to like the pre-reveal, post-reveal kind of idea, um, but kind of just, you know, taken to the next level when you have multiple stages of ways to, to change your NFT over time. Um, and there are some kind of just cool, crazy ideas that don't really have necessarily a uh tie to like a you know solving a real world business use case or something like that and those are all really fun and then there are kind of the web 2.5 ideas where like how can we take nft uh tech and apply it in a web 2 way uh so we're solving problems um one other really cool idea that i like so and if you think about the core affordances of an nft it's essentially a standard so it says you know transfer looks like this uh purchase uh, looks like this. Uh, ownership is defined like this. And um, it starts to get really interesting when you think about how can we alter these core definitions in ways that's really interesting. So another thing that I've always wanted to do is create the viral, the viral NFT. 
Uh, so, you know, imagine a patient zero who mints the first NFT and then they transfer it to someone, but you could alter the transfer function. So anytime you transfer to another wallet, it mints you a new one. And so you can't really ever get rid of the virus because when you transfer it out, it just mints you a new one. It and, sounds like a virus NFT, not a viral one. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, yep. It's a virus NFT, yes. And then uh, you could even change rarity. So the more you transfer out, the more rare the NFT that's minted to your account. So you're incentivized to spread, spread the I'm virus. I'm not sure if it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you could even track... So, you know, I spread it to this person who then spread it to that person who then spread it to that person. Like you could track the spread and you could award like points and have a leaderboard. Uh, like ideas like this where you're modifying transfer ownership in interesting ways, like maybe it's gimmicky, but maybe it's really, really cool. And maybe it, you know, spawns other interesting ideas for like possibilities of how we can change, you know, these core functions in ways that is interesting. It can you know, actually apply to something in life and not just infect everyone's wallet with this, with this virus. Spam competition, love it. Yep. You don't have enough of those. Yeah, good. Yeah. good. Yep, absolutely. Uh, let me see if there were any other fun ideas that I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, we should talk about the mystery box. Okay, so in, if you think about an NFT, it's just data stored on the blockchain. Uh, with, you know, an identifier with an owner, you know, I mean, there, there is, there's some standards to it, but uh, it's basically just data. So anything that is data could be on the blockchain, uh, you know, videos, GIFs, uh, images, PDFs, content, uh, you know, and so one idea for an NFT is using the NFT as like a basket or like a mystery box or like a place to hold other things. Uh, so for example, an, an NFT could hold other NFTs and you can make a little like NFT mystery box and you know sell it and you get kind of an assortment of NFTs or you could store fungible tokens in your NFT. So the NFT is essentially the owner and in, in the fungible token registry, you can have the NFT own, own fungible tokens. Um, you could have an NFT be a controller of a canister. So there's there's an there's an identity, and whoever owns the NFT is the one that's allowed to make changes to a canister. So then, when you transfer the NFT, you're transferring canister ownership as well, uh, which is really cool because you could have like an entire business as an NFT. You could have a canister that's serving up a front end. You could have it collecting revenue, sending uh, ICP to the canister. And then all of that could be controlled via NFT ownership. And when you sell the NFT, you're essentially doing a complete transfer of all assets to another person. So it's like the most efficient business transaction of all time. Uh, you know, one click, one click. I mean, maybe this is all theoretical, like no one's done this, but it, I think it's possible and it would be really, really cool. Uh, I mean, Origin is working on something similar where you can transfer the, um, you can transfer NFT, which is being the watch, it represents a, a luxury watch. And then that, that transfer of ownership gives you the watch as well. So you have the connection between real life assets and, and the NFTs. Yep. And, that, and when you were talking about NFT owning a basket, NFT being a beholder of other NFTs, I thought of you can have a, a complete hierarchical structure. For example, we have an NFT city that has NFT buildings in it, and each NFT building has an NFT apartment, and you can go down and down uh, yep. if you build a game like this. Yeah, so, yeah. If, if, if you wanted to architect it via NFTs, you, you, you definitely could. Um, yeah, we have an anonymous attendee question. Cool ideas, but they can be developed on any blockchain. Why the IC? Uh, when I look at why the IC, it's because we have a reverse gas model. Uh, assets can be stored on chain. Uh, we have low storage costs. If you look at the speed, you have two second finality. And so updates can generally be done in two seconds and then reads, you know, are sub second. And uh, then finally, the, the final piece is just scale. So with the subnet architecture, I might call them native subnets on the IC compared to like 
Avalanche, Avalanche also has subnets, but the subnets are kind of their own chain. Uh, you need a new token, you need new validators. And so when you scale that way, it's just not as seamless as on the internet computer where you have the same token, you have the same validators, you just spin up more subnets on, on more nodes. So I would say the internet computer is best positioned to scale to infinity essentially um, because of the subnet architecture and because of you know the cryptography that supports the protocol. And so because of the scale and because of you know all those other benefits, it just feels like the right place to, to build on the internet computer. Obviously there are other chains and there are big thriving NFT ecosystems on other chains. And I think that's great, uh, but I think the internet computer you know, will be the, the king of, of the NFT space one day. Uh, maybe in, in partnership with Ethereum, I know Ethereum has the majority of the you know, total value uh, but with the uh, ETH ICP integration, I mean, maybe there are ways to kind of take advantage of the ecosystem on Ethereum, but the amazing tech on the IC and combine those in interesting ways. I have a few crazy ideas of ways to kind of bring the two ecosystems together that we'll see. We'll see. We what can happens. get into those as well. Yeah, we can get into those as well. Yeah. yeah. If you imagine millions of people transacting and interacting with NFTs on chain every day, then that wouldn't be possible in, in some other chains. If you if we see what what happened on on ETH a couple of weeks ago with the hundred plus million dollars of gas fees, that that wouldn't happen in the IC at least uh, not with the current infrastructure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's a little kind of you know us you know running around in the woods together talking about NFTs, uh, crazy NFT ideas. Uh, let's talk about NFT standards. Uh, right now, there is not a core accepted standard for NFTs on the internet computer. This is kind of a downside because everyone can't just pick the standard and then build from it. Um, so this is, I mean, there's a Definity technical working group that's working on this right now. There's a core core team working on token standards. And, uh, but and interoperability is starting to become kind of painful. So there's no like marketplace interoperability right now. You know, if you go to the CCC marketplace, they have different methods. If you go to the Gigaverse marketplace, they have different methods. If you go to Entrepo, we have different methods. And um, so from an NFT standard perspective, the I would probably say the 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 NFT standard that's been used the most is the EXT standard. Uh, from Tonic Labs. This is because we've launched the most NFT projects. Uh, and obviously we use our standard. Uh, so that's probably the one that's used the most. Some people like it, some people don't like it as much. There is a kind of more pared down version of, of an NFT standard in the DIP 721 standard. That's kind of analogous to the ERC uh, 721 standard from Ethereum. And uh, the, the way that I see standards going in the future, or at least the way that I want them to go is I want a core standard that handles like registry and transfers and uh, things like that. And I want it to be like a core accepted standard. And then I want it to be black hole. So there's no controller, no one that can modify the registry. And then I want extensions to that core standard. And extensions could be anything. It could be, hey, I want to support you know, the Entrepot Marketplace. Okay, here's your Entrepot Marketplace, you know, extension methods. I want to support the CCC Marketplace. Okay, here's your Marketplace extension methods. I want to support uh, wearables. Uh, you know, I want to add wearables to my NFT. Okay, here's a wearable extension. And maybe these extensions are separate canisters. Uh, maybe you can stick all the extensions on a single secondary canister, or maybe there are multiple. But having this kind of extension architecture is interesting because you can have immutability in the core registry while still having space to do interesting things that might be mutable on top of it without affecting kind of the core the core NFT standard. So that's how kind of- be, How can it be separate canisters? So if we have one NFT, then how do you have these separate canisters dealing with the core of that NFT as well as the, these additions and extensions? You could think about like, so wearables, you could have, um, 
wearables could either be done via the canister side or via the front end side. Uh, if done via the front end side, then you would need to modify, you would probably need some way in the base canister to be able to add extensions. Um, whether it's you know a method to be able to plug in extensions or something like that. I mean, you're going to need additional data in there. Um, and that's probably okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be something like that where you have uh, an extension component or a function, some way to get additional data to external pointing, whether it's canisters or whether it's additional data. Uh, that's probably the way. I have one more question. So that is, um, I know that IC turtles appear or they launched both on Entrepot as well as on CCC. So that means they support both uh, standards. Do you know how how they did that technically or how uh, someone can do that? Yeah, so they're not supported natively on Entrepot, meaning that you have to wrap the NFT before they can be supported on Entrepot. This is similar to the ICATs, IC cats. Um, from Gigaverse Labs, as well as um, I, I see punks. Uh, the punks as well, they're, they're all wrapped, facilitated via wrapping. So wrapping is really interesting. It's kind of just like creating a, an extension, you could say, where you have like an EXT NFT that is, you know, essentially minted, but then points to methods on another canister. Uh, or, or in other standards. So you map transfer to transfer and you map, you know, purchase to buy now. And uh, the way that it, essentially you just have a proxy and that's how you interact. So that's currently how it's done. Um, the wrapping isn't very elegant right now and it's kind of painful having to like load it in and then wrap it and then list it. And then if you sell it, you have to unwrap it and transfer it back out. And so, you know, exploring different ways to do, like, can we do simultaneous wrapping or like on purchase? Is there a way to do like a wrapping on purchase rather than having to do it beforehand? Um, generally, wrapping is painful. So, you know, if it was possible to do individual marketplace standards, the extensions, that feels really nice. Or if we can agree on a standard and then we don't need wrapping. <laughs> yep. Or we support all the standards and that's... In the same canister? Um, as long as methods are namespaced, you could do that. We don't have namespaced methods right now. Namespaced meaning, you know, if we have a transfer method and CCC has a transfer method and they're not the same transfer method, then it's not going to be compatible. But if we can say, you know, we have EXT underscore transfer, then you could actually implement everything in the same canister, and that would be interesting. Uh, but, yeah, that's, uh, that's currently the land on the standards front. Um, what else? Anyone on the, uh, anyone on the call? What direction would you like to go next? We could look at okay. specific example NFT projects, uh, could dive in on the entrepreneur side and look at some cool, cool projects and what they're doing. Um, we could talk more about crazy NFT ideas. Um, we could talk about NFT and fungible token mashups. Uh, what do you guys think? Throw it in the chat for, uh, for questions. I mean, I'm happy to go whatever direction you all want. Let the people decide. And if the people don't decide, then uh, I'll be the dictator. Yep. Anyone? All right. All right, let's do NFT and, uh, and fungible mashups because I don't know what these are. All right, N NFTs and fungible token mashups. So uh, we don't have, let's see, do we? So you can stake zombies and affinity gangs on the CCC marketplace and you can get, you might get wrapped ICP. I don't think you actually get a token. I know ICP dog is working on a staking site where you can stake ICP and get token, but I don't know if it's live yet. So the idea is you use NFTs plus staking plus other kinds of mechanisms in order to earn token. And this token, so for example, we could use, you know, chronics as an example. You could stake a chronic. A chronic is a specific NFT on Entrepot. Uh, 
released by Tonic Labs. Uh, you could stake your Chronic and you could get a token like CRN, for example, you know, just a, just a fungible token. And then you can then do things with that fungible token. And so some uh, games on Ethereum are really just, you know, imagine doing actions with your NFT and based on those actions, you get fungible token A. And then with fungible token A, you can mint another NFT to stake and get fungible token B. And with fungible token A and B, you can then do things to get another fungible token C. And it's game-based because, uh, like, uh, I'll just use a specific example. There's a game on Ethereum called Ether Orcs. Uh, you can go and buy orcs. And then with orcs, you can actually stake the orcs in different things. Like they can farm or they can pillage or they can you know, do, do other things. And based on what you do, you either level up your orc or you get resources for having, you know, sent your orc out to, to battle, for example. Then you can earn a, a specific token. And once you get enough of that, you can mint a new sidekick, essentially. And so there are like healers that are sidekicks and there are other kinds of, you know, NFTs that are, that are uh, available. And it's basically just a staking game. Uh, so you have an NFT, you stake it, you get fungible token. With that fungible token, you can mint more NFTs. And then with those NFTs, they give you additional benefits in the game and you can stake them or send them out on quests or things like that to get more fungible tokens. So we haven't really seen a staking game like this on the internet computer yet. And I really want one. I just want to sit around and send my NFTs on quests and earn token. Like someone just build it and tell me and I'm all in. Uh, so yeah, something like that is really cool. I know that, let's see, I think mutant, let me just check really quick. I think, did they launch? Yeah, this style is similar to the Farmville type of game when you have wait 10 minutes while your, I don't know, building is being built. Except yep. that it's not the, the mother company who gets all the rewards, but the, the users receive them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mutant Space Apes is another example. Uh, Definity Space Apes is a collection on Entrepot. They just released Mutant Space Apes at the beginning of this call. So like 34 minutes ago. Um, and the, they're reserving half of the supply of their Mutant Space Apes. And you have to earn it in game. So they have... They're, they're about to release their planet games and you have to go and earn their token. Uh, and then with their token, you can mint more mutant space apes. And so- Can you share your screen? There is a request if you can share your screen so we can also see uh, apes. People want apes. Okay. Right. This, is, this is the mutant space apes launch page currently live right now. Uh, you know, they're about 50% sold. Um, let's see if we can actually find what some of these look like. Yeah, here we go. These are the mutant space apes. You can see some really cool melty bulgy eyes, you know, the monster hat. Now the artwork is also getting closer to, to ETH. The yeah. ETH club. Yep. Yeah, so this this is the mutant version of of these apes. These are the you know the clean clean space apes. Each one has a planet. <clears throat> um, yeah, so they are airdropping. You know, if you own, <clears throat> I think it's three three from the same planet, then they'll airdrop you a planet NFT, which is interesting. You know, airdrops based on collecting, and then you can actually play the game for that specific planet and each planet has different rarity and you get token based on uh, based on playing the game. And then you can mint these mutant mutant apes uh, with your token. So they, they did like kind of a half sale, half, half earn, earn in game. So that's really cool. Uh, I really want a staking game, uh, and we're we're close. Other cool things, uh, if you've seen BTC Flower, there. If you look at the pedals, hold on, we got to wait for it to load here. 
the pedals here, they, they actually get the price of Bitcoin and then they feed it in and the pedals shimmer based on like the past seven day gain or loss of Bitcoin. Uh, so that's really interesting uh, just from a, you know, an idea perspective of how can we pipe external data into our NFT in ways that will make it change or make it interactive. Um, yeah, we haven't seen a lot of that. Uh, you could almost think of the internet computer as uh, an Oracle-like system like Chainlink almost, where you could have a single canister and that canister can make you know 30 different API requests to 30 different places to get the price of something and then have some logic in the canister that determines the price and then that you know sets the price and then you could query the price from this canister. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of that either yet, uh, but also a really interesting idea. Let's see, Poked, Poked Studio uh, bots, they're also doing something interesting. They, he's been working on mute, not, not mutant. Are they mutant or are they mega? I think it's like Gen 2. Yeah, 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 Gen 2. So yeah. been been working on some Gen 2 bots with you know, these little circle driver guys. He has some two driver, three driver, four driver uh, Gen 2 bots. And there's a burn mechanism in order to get them. So you have to burn your Gen 1 bots in order to get your Gen 2 bots. Um, so that's really interesting. It's interesting because it reduces supply of the Gen 1 collection, uh, you know, making them more valuable, but simultaneously, you know, adds value and gives holders a benefit where, you know, if you bought a bunch of these at Mint, I think they were like five, four or five ICP, um, where now the floor is around, you know, 20. And then you can burn them, you can get the Gen 2s, and the Gen 2s are going to be a smaller supply and also be really, really awesome. So that kind of burn mechanism, we've seen a little bit, but I, I expect we'll see more of that moving forward. Um, and there's another question from Rudy. So you mentioned uh, making a chain link like canister. Mm -hmm. Can you currently make Web2 requests on the IC? How would you get uh, prices? Yeah, currently you can't do HTTP requests um, from canisters, but it's coming soon. Is that right? Yes, that like, is correct. Like a month, maybe? Maybe more? Uh, I don't want to comment on video. Yeah. I don't want to comment on timeline on video. It's, uh... <laughs> Can I get an exact date for when we're going to get HTTP requests? At please? three o'clock no. in June. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're you're right, Rudy. Can't do it yet, uh, but we're very very close. Within so, month, probably low how, month. How does uh, Bitcoin Flower do it? I don't know how they do it. It might just be a centralized, uh, centralized price where then you can just stick you know you could push stuff into a canister um so maybe centralized service collecting the price and then you know push push price into a canister that's that's probably the way to do it because you can't you can't pull pull from canisters right now no so not many photo or music NFTs on the ic yet and reasons yeah that's really good yeah, I was just going to say, that's a really good question. I really like this collection, pattern-based, because if you look at their specific NFT, um, let's view the NFT on chain, actually. Uh, you can see that it's interac or it's uh, uh, interactive, sure. Uh, and it has text, it has background, but it also has a sound button. And so... When you push the sound, it actually makes kind of like a brown bear-like sound that matches the heartbeat. So this, this collection is all about like uh, how animals have different heartbeats and then the music goes along with the, with, with the beat of the heartbeat. But it's cool because there's a, this is an interactive kind of experience. You have a audio button, you have you know an, an actual like NFT moving. I think this is all SVG. Um, but a really interesting example of image plus interactivity plus audio all in one. Another good example of this that I wanted to show is the Saga collection. So 
Uh, Jorgen Builder is one of the top Matoko builders on the IC. He's releasing a kind of series of uh, tarot cards. But I really like his collection because his interactive NFT, or his, his, his NFT kind of sits in this interactive viewer. So it's more of like an experience. So you'll see up in the top left, he has a whole bunch of different stats for his NFT. Like no, no other collection has done something like this where they've actually piped stats into the NFT. You can see here we have a static view and an animated view. You can see I can like click it, I can move around, you know, flips it around. There's a static view as well. Mm, static view is a little big for this view, but um, I just like the kind of interactive experience there. So there are some people doing uh, audio plus interactivity, but not, not a ton. Uh, it's probably just harder. That's probably the reason why. It's probably harder to do something like that. But I think this kind of interactive NXT experience is really cool and we need more of them. I know there's another group doing, I think it randomly generates image and music based on minting. Uh, I, I think we're trying to list them right now on Entrepot, but we don't, uh, we're just making sure, you know, they have all the methods implemented, so. I think we have a music specific NFT somewhere uh, closer to the bottom. So it just- oh, yeah. uh, store. Yeah. Uh, not Club Canny. What is it? P2J? Where is... Oh, it's Revolucio. Okay, so this is a music NFT, audio NFT. And if you click it and view on chain, then you actually get the video, I believe. Here the video and the audio is stored on chain as well, right? Yeah, everything's on chain, yep. So there's audio playing. You probably can't hear it, but I can hear yep. it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there's there's an example. Uh, okay, which project in your opinion is the CryptoPunk equivalent in five years? Man, is, isn't, isn't that the question of the, of the, of the year? Question of the, of the decade. Uh, I mean, one argument is, I mean, did you really mean to say CryptoPunk or maybe you meant to say Bored Ape because the Bored Ape floor is higher than CryptoPunk. Uh, you could argue, you know, CryptoPunks are the OGs and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have high floor value forever. But right now, Bored Apes are delivering a lot of value to their collection holders. And so you have Bored Apes, you have Mutant Apes, you have Kennel Dogs, you have the Ape Token. If you look at the value given to a single Bored Ape holder, it's something like $200,000 uh, or more. Was it more? I think the ape alone that they were given was $200,000, the ape token. And if you include everything, it was probably closer to a million, um, which is just absolutely insane. Uh, you know, obviously the most hyped NFT collection and kind of the, the leader right now, extremely well-funded, very trusted team. Uh, awesome execution, uh, doing really good things in the space. So could we find, uh, you know, Bored Ape uh, equivalent or CryptoPunk equivalent on the IC? Um, maybe. Uh, you know, mass mass speculation here. So nobody go, let me first put a caveat here. Nobody go buy tons of this collection just because of what I say right now. It doesn't mean anything. I could be completely wrong. All these NFTs could go to zero. You know, whatever other not, not, not financial advice you need. Uh, some of the really cool builders, I think, are the ones that we're going to see some interesting things. And in terms of like moving floor price, I always like people demonstrating that they can build uh, because that's a, that's one way to create value. And so BTC Flower, ETH Flower, ICP Flower coming, Flower Punks coming, uh, they've built their own kind of governance system. They call it the Flower Power DAO. Uh, you know, because how could you not have a flower power now? Uh, it, it, it just rings off the tongue. Uh, but really interesting governance system where it's one NFT, one vote. Or I think BTC flower might get more votes, ETH flower might get less votes, et cetera. Uh, but then they have governance and their community decides a lot of the things. So, you know, where should we mint our next collection or uh, how should we reward holders or what are the requirements for XYZ? Uh, so they've, and they've done a lot of really interesting visual things as well. So definitely 
well and also you know incredible floor price on on their different collections so definitely a powerhouse right now and based on their ability to build i don't see that going away and honestly that's similar to a lot of these top collections uh poked studio you know um, amazing artist uh incredible work uh with the gen 1 collection doing gen 2 collection they're all going to be 3d rigged um, he's done tons of artwork before, building kind of like a bot universe kind of thing. Some incredible video promos. Um, punks, uh, they've released a number of collections, some on Polygon, some on Ethereum, some on the internet computer. They have an I IC marketplace. Um, I see Dinos, similarly. If you go back to the ETH flower, for example, and BTC flower, how do you see a, a collection like this being sustainably funded long term? Because you can't always sell the same NFTs because then you run out of your treasury and then you can no longer fund the, the project. Do you have ideas on how new builders can, can create a sustainably fundable uh, project? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people use an NFT launch as like a, like a Kickstarter of sorts where you say, hey, I, I think I'm going to do this. It's going to be really awesome and you should buy my NFT and get in early. And it's a little bit better than Kickstarter because you actually get a digital, you know, uh, token verifying that I was one of the early backers. So then it's public and anyone can know who you are. And so I've seen some collaborations where people have said, you know, we want to give whitelist opportunities to BTC Flower. Or we want to give airdrop opportunities to BTC Flower holders or things like that. So now people can start to identify, hey, you were early on this project or you have some of this NFT. I want to target you as a potential customer. Um, did that answer your question? Oh, funding. Uh, yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So similar to Kickstarter, I mean, if you can raise enough to handle, I don't know, six to 12 months of building expenses, then, uh, I mean, if you look at volume, I mean, they've had 170 K ICP in volume. And if you say, I don't know what the collection fee is, maybe 5%, uh, you can get, uh, you know, decent, decent revenue just from volume of secondary sales on BTC Flower and ETH Flower. Um, obviously, launching more collections is a way to do it or airdropping. Uh, well, airdropping won't fund, but will benefit holders. Um, so after that, it's probably just finding revenue models that work for your specific project, whether you're building a uh, DAO governance system or whether you're building, uh, you know, some other kind of product, you know, there's got to be a business model in there somewhere, unless it's just relying on NFT sales, primary sales and secondary market royalties, which also is maybe not a crazy idea if you can have, you know, a top tier collection like, like, you know, some of these. Right. And I guess eventually you can connect, uh, connect this to the SNS and have your custom token that is connected to the to the uh, holders of the NFTs or it's connected to the NFTs and then holders of these NFTs get rewarded with these uh, uh, governance tokens. Yeah, sure. Once the SNS is out, also uh, no commitment. Yep, yep, yep. Right, we, have, okay, we have a question from the community. Um, what are the main synergies between games and NFTs? Yeah, that's a good question. If you think about a game, We've already had NFT-like functionality in game assets and skins and items for a long time. You know, we've had, uh, you know, let's play World of Warcraft for 8,000 hours and make an incredible account and then let's sell it to someone, you know, sell it and make money. And there's some pain here because there, is, there isn't like an accepted, you know, account marketplace right now. Uh, so it's more like a, you know, I, I don't actually know who brokers those transactions, but uh, there's like a black market for all game items or accounts or things like that. And NFTs just simplifies that process. So game items, uh, armor, uh, weapons could all be NFTs. Game characters, you know, heroes could all be NFTs. And then it makes it really easy to get a hero, level them up, sell them on the marketplace, you know, go out in the game, find the really rare sword or whatever, and then sell it on the marketplace. Um, I think it feels natural to me that people would want to do something like this. Even skins, you could have community generated skins where 
you open up kind of a contest, community members submit different game items. You know, there could be an accepted game item format. There could be some specific standard to follow. And then community submits and community votes. And whoever uh, whoever wins the contest actually gets their item included in the game as an NFT. There could even be royalties to the original artist. You know, you could break down secondary royalties on specific NFTs based on uh, contributions from the community. Like things like that get me really excited to have community generated and community contributions into a game and having the opportunity to really easily do royalties and other things like that, where in order to do this in a, in a game right now, it's just hard to make it happen. Uh, you, you could do it, you could build all the tech to do it, but it just feels a little bit more streamlined uh, from an NFT blockchain perspective. That's a really good idea. So, yeah, please, someone build this. It's, uh, yeah, agreed. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, what do you see in, uh, let's say, two to five years of the future of NFT gaming in general, maybe IC NFT gaming? When are we seeing the first uh, World of Warcraft uh, type game? Well, not type game, but this level of quality and, and scale. Yeah, hopefully not too soon, or I might fall off fall off a cliff just diving deep into uh, World of Warcraft 2.0. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe people can wait, wait a couple of years to build something like that. Uh, but no, it, it does take time. I mean, we're probably, I know there's a few people building really big scale scope games on the IC. And it's going to take time. I don't know how much time. Maybe it's a year. Maybe it's three years uh, to really get to a good place. We could probably get a vertical slice, like a really, really good scaled down, scoped down MVP version of one of these games here in the next year or so. Um, you can you can scale that up over the years. Right. The MVP. Right. So, I mean, it's inevitable that they're coming. Uh, multiplayer is still a little tricky on the IC because of update update times. Uh, you know, with two second finality, it's not. I mean, you can't do rights and do real-time multiplayer with two-second finality unless you're really creative, I think. Um, I think there are some potential workarounds. Um, but yeah, uh, likely within the next few years, we see, see things like that. I think um, it'll be interesting to see how the community responds to NFT projects over time. You know, early last year, you just mint an NFT project and you're going to do really well. Um, now uh, you mint an NFT project and you'll sit on the launch page for a while because you have to really show the community that you're going to bring value. Uh, and so, you know, the standard is always going up for NFT projects. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, in a year, what what is the standard for projects there? And it's, it's the same thing that we've seen in in Ethereum and in Solana where Initially, there's kind of a cash grab phase where anyone can just mint anything and the community's like, yeah, NFTs. Uh, but then eventually, maybe it's you get burned enough times or maybe just as time passes, you're not as impressed. Uh, but I think eventually we'll see the NFT space maturing to where you want uh, either really like good community. I could see people buying NFTs for community or really good tech or really good value or really good art. Um, and maybe there are combinations of those, but uh, yeah, the, the bar is definitely continually being raised for NFT projects. As it should be. It's, uh, then it's the quality of the project increases with the, with the bar. So it's good to see. Yep. All right. Any more questions from the community? Um, I think we don't have enough time to shield self-minting logical, but we can do that. Another time, unless you, nah, we shouldn't uh, put it in four minutes. Uh, I'll just give a 30 second, 30 second spiel on it. Uh, give, a, are, give, give a four minute spiel on it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we're working on a self minting tool. It's live uh, in, well, it's, it's in a closed beta right now. Uh, the minting tool is basically a way, kind of like a GUI for anyone to be able to mint NFTs. So you can go in, pick all your launch settings, you get a launch page on Entrepot, pick all your marketplace settings, you know, you get a collection on the marketplace, you upload all your assets, and then you submit for review. 
And then there's kind of like uh, some automated review processes that happen on our end and then automated kind of canister creation and image upload and things that go on. Uh, but it's essentially a way to enable creators to mint NFTs by themselves without needing a developer to come in and do it for them. Uh, I know a lot of people are restricted in that realm where they're not technical, but they might be a really, really good artist. And so we're trying to enable all creators, businesses, et cetera, to mint NFTs uh, that way. Uh, and then over time, I imagine we'll continue to build out interesting tools on top of this self-minting tool. Like imagine if you could just click a box that says add wearables to my collection. You just drop in assets and it just spins up all the canister infrastructure. Uh, that would be amazing. Or maybe you want a custom launch page. It would be really cool to check a button and say, I want a custom launch page and then have an editor that lets you build your own launch page. Or it would be cool to say, I want a cool burn mechanism and I want to drop it in on my website and here's an embed code and just throw the embed code on and throw this canister code in your canister and then you're done. Uh, these kinds of tools, I think is going to be a focus for Tonic Labs moving forward. We're going to try to see how can we enable businesses and creators and game developers to, you know, leverage uh, all of the tooling that we're building in their businesses in in ways that's meaningful and extremely easy to use and profitable for them. Uh, so yeah, move, moving forward, expect uh, many more uh, cool and useful tools from the Tonic side, building on this kind of self minting experience. Awesome, looking forward to it. All right, I think uh, we're about on time. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, for the the wealth of information on NFTs, and uh, I hope you I hope a lot of uh, the attendees and people on YouTube are inspired to develop cool stuff and develop the game for Bob that uh, that he requested. Yes, please. And <laughs> tomorrow we have another workshop that is going to be an interview with IC Gallery. So please, it's going to be on uh, at five PM Central Europe time. You should see it if you have the calendar that is Inner Computer Developer Events. You should see it there or. We'll put it on Twitter and everywhere else. So yeah, please join us. And uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for, for being here.